The words to our response are, the words of music are in the bulletin today.
God of hope and encouragement, we come in the midst of this season of busyness and preparation. Help us to slow down. Help us to slow down to listen for your voice. Guide us in reflecting on what our true preparations should be. Preparing our minds to focus on your promise of a Messiah that will come, that will change everything. We need to prepare our spirits to praise God for prophecy and promises. We need to prepare to find hope and encouragement, peace and joy. In this time, help us prepare our hearts to receive also the gifts of love and hope. May this time of worship open our hearts and minds to be attuned to your voice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you are able, let us stand together and sing our opening hymn number nine, O come, O come, the name of Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, God's promises are sure. Promises of steadfast love and forgiveness. God deals with God's people with justice. And in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. Amen. Let us stand together for our response.
Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In the encounter of that collection of the Advent Jesus and John the Baptist, here now is the Lord's God. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Materia and Charconaxis and Placidia, tetrarch of Avalon, during the high priesthood of Ananias and Sapphira, the word of God came to John, son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a, the voice, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him, Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, and the rough way smooth. And all people will see God's salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I spent a lot of time on the highway over this past year, going to and coming from my parents' home in Red Oak. My routes include the bike highways and interstates. Those kind of roads are efficient for moving people and goods from place to place. Those kind of roads are designed to keep people as safe as possible for travel at higher speeds. And during my travels over the course of the summer, spring and summer, I've encountered a lot of road construction. As we all know, in our part of the world, spring, summer, and fall are construction season. And there have been four big projects on my regular route. Most of them bridge or bridge approaches uh, being replaced or raised. And most recently, my regular southern route had to be changed because there was work on Interstate 29 around the bluff and up on that little border that goes between the two cities. So now I've been rerouting, go south of Blair, get on 880, and then eventually you follow that and it turns, takes you down to 29. Interesting thing to me is we've done that. Construction detour was another construction project going on. This is that kind of project where they reroute the four lanes, they merge down to two, and then you go for a while and then they put you back out into four lanes again. Now, when you drive through a construction zone, it is different than regular interstate driving, right? You're required to slow down, you're required to pay attention to the signs and the speed limits and the flag people or the pace of or the lead part sometimes is taking you from one end to the other. And it's often posted that there are financial uh, consequences for breaking speed limits and not paying attention to those kind of things in construction zones. Then, of course, there's danger to the drivers and construction workers if you don't follow those signs. Now, we know that divided highways or interstates allow separate sets of lanes of traffic to move in different directions safely. 
But you know, sometimes even on those traffic uh, highways, you can kind of get into a day. You can be preoccupied by the thoughts or the radio, or maybe you've got somebody in the car and you're visiting along, and you kind of just get into a day, sort of lose your focus. A few years ago, I was on the way to a pastor's event in the scene of Wisconsin, and I was traveling along a divided highway I'm in Wisconsin. The cruise control was set. I was settled in for an easy drive because traffic was really pretty light. When the sight of flashing lights in my rear view mirror got my attention pretty quickly, I checked the speed on the car. I looked around for another car that might be the focus of that super's attention, but it was just me. I was the only one in that whole stretch. Well, wondering what in the world I had done, and I slowed down and pulled over. And the officer asked if I knew I was going 65 and 65 mile an hour zone. Well, I knew I was going 65, but I didn't know that the posted speed on this stretch of the divided highway was only 55. I kind of made an assumption since it was a divided road, it might indicate that I could drive 65. So I made an assumption based on my interstate experience that created bad habits. The officer was very gracious, and she let me go with the warning. Our words from John the Baptist and Malachi this morning are kind of like flashing lights in the rear view mirror. They get our attention. They indicate it's time to snap out of our ways and focus on getting ready. John's words echo those of his predecessors, the prophets Isaiah and Malachi. Malachi was giving a prophetic word pointing out how the people of God had gone their own way and not paid attention to God's of God's law. And that when the promised Messiah came, there would be a refining of the people. Now it was some 400 years between the time of the prophet Malachi and when John the Baptist came onto the scene. You remember John was of a priestly lineage on both sides of his family. He was named by the angel Gabriel as having the spirit and power of Elijah and fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. And you recall also that John was a relative of Jesus, just a few months older than Jesus. And so here's John. He's preceding Jesus. He's preparing the way, foretelling of the one who was to come, the Messiah, the one who was to be the salvation of Israel. John was pretty much an in your face kind of prophet. Living in the desert, his rough clothes made from camel hair. John might be compared to a street corner preacher, say, in New York City, with his sandal feet, his long hair, a big beard, and shouting at everybody who walked by. Certainly, John was going to be noticed. John was not politically correct. He told people that they were sinners. He didn't mince words. And that included the powerful. John called out the ruler Herod for the sin of marrying his brother's wife. Indeed, John's role was to get everybody ready for Jesus. He preached, prepare the way, make the crooked straight, smooth out the rough places. John called for repentance, and indeed, he proclaimed a baptism of repentance as, as well as the forgiveness of sin. And the people gathered to hear, and they took in every word. And God spoke to their hearts, and they were convicted of their sins, and they repented. John was a unique person. He was godly, he was charismatic, and he was effective. He was moved by God. God sometimes uses the most unexpected methods to communicate with us, to help us reorient our hearts and minds, to get our attention, to slow us down, to make room, to make ready for the Christ. God will use an interaction between a student and a teacher, a doctor and a patient, a child and their parents. Perhaps God can use a television program, a cancer diagnosis, the birth of a child, a newspaper article, or even the beauty and wonder of the nature around us. God uses whatever method is needed to get through to us. And sometimes God has to straighten us out before we can start in a new direction, before we'll fully listen and follow Jesus Christ. But whether it's John the Baptist or some other way, whatever it takes, no matter how unusual, God shouts or whispers or communicates his message to each of us. 
God wants us to face our sins, confess that we are guilty, repent, and encounter Christ so that we might reveal Christ to others. Now we may feel like we are preparing for the season, but often we've got the cruise control on and we're busy living our own in our own self-made world. And God can get pushed into the background. God can get pushed be behind the season's trapping of parties and shopping and baking and entertaining. John says, prepare the way. Well, how do we prepare for the coming of the Messiah? Our preparation should involve the examination of our lives, our values, our priorities. Will you prepare for the embracing of Jesus Christ in your life as you would prepare for receiving visitors in your home? Unless we hear and see John's words, we're not really ready for Advent or Christ coming. We're not ready for God to break into our lives, to change us. To heed John's voice, we need to change our focus from the world around us. We need to slow down, to pay attention, to surrender to the mystery and complexity and wonder of Emmanuel, of God with us. We prepare our hearts as we join together in worship with our faith community. And when we lift our voices in the common things like the Lord's Prayer, we join that great cloud of witnesses who walked this road before. Or when we voice the words of the Apostles' Creed, we affirm the promises of the communion of saints of life everlasting. When we sing the hymns of the church, including the carols of Advent and Christmas, we hear in the melodies and the harmonies the promises of scripture, and we are reminded again of those who turn to these songs for hope and comfort and strength through the years. And in the words of our scriptures, we feel the heartbeat of the prophets like Malachi and John the Baptist, Apostles Peter and Paul, and others who were in power to live into God's promises. And we're granted the courage to face unknown futures unafraid. We prepare by participating sacramentally in the life and death and resurrection of our Lord. We make the way straight by living out the presence of Christ among us. As we gather around the communion table, we remember what Jesus did for us some 2,000 years ago. And while we live in the present and the not yet, as Christ has not yet returned, we await for that promise to be fulfilled. And whether at the communion table or the baptismal font, we attest to the presence of the great cloud of witnesses that has joined in these sacred and mysterious practices, laying down a path for us to follow. These are the practices of the people of God. These are the practices that help smooth the rough places and fill in the holes in our souls. Help to prepare our hearts and minds to recognize and receive the Christ. Malachi and John the Baptist's message is that God is gracious and wants to shine light down on us. But sin, sin is serious. And we can't wave away or wish away sin. And we are reminded that if it weren't for the curse that God declared on sin, and the way that Christ took that curse upon himself, took that to the cross, we would not gather to sing carols about his birth, or we would not celebrate his resurrection by singing praises to our trying God at Easter time. John calls us to examine, to change our hearts, make our lives, to make ourselves ready to receive Christ when he returns. In the meantime, we can wait and hope in the glorious future life we've been promised. May God reveal to each of us all that is wayward in our lives, that we might do what is necessary to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his path straight, so that we might all look forward to the day when all people shall see, shall see, shall will see the salvation of God. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Please stand together as you are able for our hymn of response. It's number 10. On Jordan's bank to Baptist Christ. <laughs>
Friends, this table is not a Presbyterian table. This is our Lord's table, and it is open to all who declare Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. This table welcomes all of God's family. The brokenness and the diversity, all of God's people are welcome here. We gather at this table to share the love of our God, empowered to share that love with others. This is God's table. There is room for everyone at this table. Please remain seated and let us join together in our communion here. I come with joy to the five hundred and seven, the singing verses one, three, and four. <laughs> We pray also, O oh God, for those who grieve the loss of loved ones. 
for those who grieve the loss of dreams or homes or who find themselves adrift. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God, may folks feel your company and grace. Loving God, we will celebrate the birth of the Prince of Peace in a few weeks. And in these coming days, help us prepare to watch and to wait. We pray that we might be infused with your peace, which is always rooted in what is just and loving. We know that in Christ's dying and rising, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. And so with thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be at one with all who have gathered at this table. And then send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit. Our glory and honor yours, Almighty oh God, now and forever. And together we lift our voices in the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Will our elders come forward, please? We ask that to receive communion, you'll come down this side out of cross and receive your both your bread and your juice, and then return to your seats, and then we'll receive the elements at that time.
O God, remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from creation this bread and this wine and celebrate Christ dying and rising as we await the day he returns. Gracious God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and please your gifts of bread and juice, that the bread we drink and the cup we bless might be the communion and body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We remember and we give thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night before he gave himself up for us, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took a cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. So friends, every time we gather at this table, as we share bread and cup, we prepare our hearts, as well as proclaim the saving death of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Thanks be to God. Jesus said, this is the covenant, the new covenant sealed with my blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Thanks be to God. Let us join together in our unison prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, through the gift of this child, you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. We have shared the bread of life and received the cup of salvation. May we be with you. Use our lives to bring light and light into the dark corners of your kingdom. May our love be your love, reaching out into the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, in this season of giving, we remember that our God is the greatest giver ever, giving us life and love and salvation and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And so in response to God's gracious giving, we return a portion of what we have received from our labor to God's The offering box is that we do from this sanctuary. I'm happy to say that we didn't get this in the bulletin, but we have a special meeting this morning. Um, Mark is going to give hallelujah. This is hallelujah.